Good day and welcome to February's uh, virtual retirement seminar. I'm Josh Black. I'm your moderator today for uh, today's seminar. With me today are two very knowledgeable retirement specialists, Kim Tuck and Patrick Hancock. And we've got a great presentation to go over today with you um, and we'll provide opportunities for you to ask questions and get answers. Um, this session is recorded. After the session is over today, we will send it out via hotline over the next couple of days. So if you miss something or need to refresh your memory on any of the content that we go over, um, feel free to rewatch it at any time. Um, you also have the option to submit questions using the chat feature. So please feel free to ask questions and throughout the presentation, we will take breaks to uh, answer your questions. And then lastly, I want to Point, uh, point you to the retirement page on the APFA website. I'm going to show you guys where you can find some really helpful information. So if you go to APFA.org, and if you're on a mobile device, you'll see this little hamburger menu on the right hand side. Just tap on that. And then under resources, we have a page dedicated to retirement. Um, one thing I'll direct you to is the Good Slide Packet, which is great for you to download, print off, whatever works for you, um, take notes on. It has a lot of really great information, um, information that we'll be going over today. Um, there's some checklists and things like that in the packet as well. And then on our website, we have uh, different hotlines that have gone out, previous videos, um, schedules, and then a lot of the same content that you'll see in the presentation today, as well as in the good slide packet. So with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to our retirement specialist. Let me get this up for you guys. Hey, Josh, it is February 15th, 2024, a really auspicious holiday. And, Valentine's? But it's the 50% off chocolate day. <laughs> and of course, in some areas of the country, they call that the retail day, Beatty's day, but you know, that just seems pushy. And we're so glad, no matter what you call this holiday, that you're spending time with us today to learn about retirement. And who are we? This is Kim Coates-Tuck. She's the National Retirement Specialist. Good morning. And, and I am Patrick Hancock, the Retirement Specialist Emeritus. I have no idea where those pictures came from. Obviously, some sort of stock, because that's, no, yeah. <laughs> We also give a shout out to Ron Harris. Hey, Ron. Uh, Ron Harris, uh, DFW flight attendant, is responsible for an awful lot of the content you will see today and uh, is just a, a dedicated uh, guy to answering people's questions. And he also helps monitor an AA Retirees Facebook page, which is very useful for a lot of our retirees. Yes, very, very good. All right, so that's who we are. You know, who we are not is. We are not the company. This is a union meeting. And I have been a union rep for a sufficient number of years that I have developed a very healthy cynicism toward my, the management at my company. And therefore, if I uh, say something that uh, offends you about the management or their abilities or inabilities to do so, um, yeah, so what? So, yeah. uh, so we're not the union, a company. We are the union. We are not your financial advisors. You may find you will need financial advisors. And as a matter of fact, we'll probably say that about six times during the course of this presentation. Talk to a financial advisor. We're also not your attorneys. We're not your Medicare advisors. We're not your Social Security advisors. You may or may not find you need those additional people as well. You'll definitely need a financial advisor. You'll probably need a Social Security advisor and maybe a Medicare. I mean, maybe a Medicare, yeah. We spent the last couple of minutes discussing a Medicare question. So, and we've been doing this a while. So, and I think Kim was right and I'm wrong, but we'll talk about that after the presentation. So, hey. I've got a question for you. There are currently 26,365 members, well, as of January, you know, we just had another class come through, so no telling what that number is now. Let's just call it 27,000. How many of those do you think are over the age of eight, eight zero, eight decades? Ha, you're wrong. We've got 25 flight attendants age 80 or older. Yikes, all right. And look at, continue on down, that is not just a, an outlier. We've got 177 in the next bucket, 70 to 74, 618. 1,900, 65 to 69, all of whom are Medicare eligible if they decide to retire. Uh, 60 to 64, 40, 4,587. 
And then uh, the largest age group is 50 to 59 with 4,680. Oh my gosh, that's 12,000 flight attendants who are over the age of 55, all of whom are gonna be eligible to retire today. So uh, if it seems like the union and actually the company occasionally too, is spending a lot of time, resources and, and energy on making sure that we get retirement information out there, that is why because such, it is such an important topic for so many of our members, even the ones that refuse to acknowledge that they're aging and eligible. And by the way, if you're 80 and over and still flying, I commend you. Yes, yes. I don't know if I'll make it, but you go. You go. <laughs> um, and actually that's 24 because uh, we had one of our 80 and older flight attendants retire last week. So we'll have to update that. But uh, yeah, and I'll miss flying with them. 50 to 54, let's go on down there. You know, it gets kind of thin when we get down here. And then look at this. We've got like, what is that? 4,000 something uh, uh, under the age of 30. That's another big group coming along. So yeah, um, that's, that's probably my favorite slide in the whole thing. Kim, what can you tell us about housekeeping? Okay, some little housekeeping items for our presentation today. Um, the good slide handout, if you have it or decide to download it from the APFA website retirement page, follows our presentation. So a lot of things we're going to tell you about, well, all of the things pretty much are in our good slide presentation. So you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. If you have the good slide presentation, you can take notes in the margin. It's very helpful information and good to have. Um, questions, you can submit them as Josh mentioned via chat. We already, already have quite a few um, ready to go for this presentation, but you can submit them, submit them throughout the presentation and please do if you have any questions. Checklist, so our good slide handout has tired and need to know what to do in the 30 days after you retire. It's all there. So um, these checklists are very, very helpful if you're planning to retire or you just retired. Also, there's a contact list. It has all the benefits, contacts, fidelity, you know, the company, where to find your retirees, uh, travel benefits, all that good stuff. And of course, the most important contact of all, which is retirement at APFA.org, because uh, in this day and age when all the departments are very siloed and you have to call multiple numbers to get information from the company, if you call us, we can kind of try and condense it for you and give you all the information from one source. All right, so retirement, what does it really mean? Well, it's composed of three um, sort of different baskets, we like to say. One is your medical benefits. The next is your retirement benefits. And then your pension um, or 401k benefits, which are your retirement income benefits. So the medical benefits, we like to refer to that as the amazing shrinking basket because after the bankruptcies, our medical benefits were pretty much reduced down to nothing when we retire. We used to have pre-funded benefits, we no longer do. You can choose to pay for those, but they're really, really expensive. And this is what's driving most of our members waiting until they're eligible for Medicare in order to retire, unless they're lucky enough to have uh, benefits through a spouse or something like that. All right, important questions you need to ask if you're gonna retire. What do you need to retire? What do you get in retirement? What about income? And what else do I need to research? So that's what we're gonna cover in our presentation today. So what do you need to retire? Well, in order to retire, sorry, phone call coming in, you need to be eligible. You need money. We can't stress that income piece enough, but most of all, you need to be ready. Um, for the company purposes, in order to retire in terms of their eligibility criteria, you must have at least 10 years of company seniority based on your date of hire and your age plus your company seniority has to equal 65 points or more. That's what they refer to as the 65 point plan. All right, let's talk about money. Patrick got some uh, yes. money. 
Let's just talk about course. money. Well, when you're doing long range planning, there are a couple of major questions you have to ask and get an answer to before you can, can even get a, a good plan going. The first is, how much do I need to have saved on the day I retire to last me the rest of my life? That kind of becomes the goal. What's my target? How much do I have to have saved? And um, that that that's one of the more common questions we get is, well, how much do I need? Well, it's different for everyone. What else you got? Do you have a second pension? Do you have another job? Does your spouse have a pension? Um, so that's one of those really good questions to ask a financial advisor, because that's one of the things they do is calculate that number for you. And then once you've got that number, you have to ask how much do I need to save each year between now and when I reach that goal? And uh, because usually when you calculate that number, you go, oh, I'm not ready yet, but yes. So. Um, and if you're if you're just if you're thinking of retiring soon and you haven't begun to address those questions, you're going to have some, I believe, corporate speak is challenges mm -hmm. because you may be here longer than you would like. This slide, my favorite uh, meme in the whole thing is the one on the bottom right there. I said you held Christmas off. Yay. Yeah. yeah. So um, the general goal in retirement is to maintain the same lifestyle you had while you were working. And I don't really like that one because I, I I don't want to be poor in retirement like I am active working. So I want to be one of those rich, wealthy retirees that, that I see in the commercials all the time with their silver sneakers, gym membership, jetting off to the Caribbean. But uh, apparently that's not the plan. So um, cruise discounts. We'll talk about after that. We have cruise <laughs> discounts. Yes. Um, so. That if you if you're going to retire at age 67, the first question you need to ask is, how long am I going to live? What? What? No, no, that's crazy. I mean, how long am I going to live? Please, uh, that's not a, that's not an answer. And the problem is that becomes the first of our answers, and and it's not an answer. So what it really is is a guesstimate. And uh, it, it may be an educated opinion. It may be a statistical probability, but it's really not an answer. And this is the most frustrating thing about retirement planning is that we're flight attendants. We want the number. We want the answer. And there isn't one. There's a good guess. There's a, and so that's just kind of the best you can do and plan for it. All right. I guess that becomes the first hour. I guess it's your life expectancy in 2022 20, is 77.3 years. Um, and it's 2020 had the largest decline since World War II. 21 was down again. 22 is down again. We just saw 23 preliminary numbers and shockingly it's down again. Thank you, uh, COVID. Thank you, opioid epidemic. Thank you, epidemic of despair. Um, but anyway, that's what it is. And so for men, that's 74.5, and for women, that's it. Well, 80.2. Woohoo. <laughs> Six years. My God. Guys, hey, I got a question. If we allegedly run the world, which I believe we do, how would that happen? I mean, should Are we? you sure of that? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe. Okay. Yeah. And also, 80.2, that means we're going to have to have more many girls. Just think about it. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I can spend more money. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you would think that running the world would get you some of the advantages like longer lifespan, but apparently that's not it. And that's less for African-Americans and more for Hispanics. I got all these numbers out of the uh, National Vital Statistics Report, Volume uh, 61, Book 6, which, by the way, is the best cure for insomnia I've ever found in my life. If you take that out of labor, you will sleep like a baby, I'm telling you. Um, and that becomes the first of our estimates. And the problem with that average is it's just an average. Half of us will die sooner, half of us will die later. Um, yeah, I, I love to tell the story. I started going gray in high school and uh, it was really not because, you know, you want to fit in everything here. I'm getting gray here. People thought I was like a professor or something. Um, and so I went home one day and I said, hey, mom, I discovered in biology class today that this gray hair is all your fault. Everything about a man's hair comes on the mother's genes. So what's going to happen next? Am I going to bald, go bald in college or do any of my uncles or grandfathers are going to go bald early? She goes, oh, honey, none of them ever live that long. <laughs> Great. Thanks, mom. A good genetic heritage, the best gift you can give your kids. So the question you have to answer is, which half are you in? We all want to be in the half that dies later. 
But half of us, literally, whatever the, the half of us are going to die sooner. Um, and which half you're in will drive some of your decisions. So that becomes the first of our guesstimates. But there are other guesstimates, for instance, salary projections. So we know salaries always go up. Unless you're in the airline industry and then, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. How about inflation? Because we know inflation always goes up, except for the last 12 years. And it's finally returning to the mean. But, uh, uh, yeah, now, so you got to kind of guess inflation. And then investment return. How are you going to do in the stock market? I don't even want to talk about it. And these guesstimates are another great reason as to why you need to talk to a financial planner. So you get that all done. And now the hardest question of all, are you ready to retire? And, you know, you, you got to be ready to retire. And because we're flight attendants, we will talk to everyone. I mean, flight attendants, we talk up and, and we'll talk to our friends. We'll talk to, you know, maybe our spouse. We'll talk to that commuter on the jump seat we've never seen before. And, and all of those people, because they love and care for you, will tell you the answer that is best for them. <laughs> because that's just the way people are. They don't, yeah, they don't know or, or probably care what the best answer is for you. Mm -hmm. um, and like I say, it's all a bunch of guesstimates and everything. There won't be one, one you, the bell rings and you go, okay, now it's time. And uh, you, know, you, may, you may find that you have just served your last tray and really are done with it. And then you go, okay, it's time to go. Um, I, I had a flight attendant tell me a couple of months ago, a retired flight attendant, and she said, you know, I wasn't 100% sure I was ready to go, but I recognized that feeling. And the feeling was the same one I had when I wasn't sure I wanted to be a stewardess because she was that old. <laughs> and uh, she said, but that seemed to have worked out well. And so I just went with that feeling that I'm pretty sure I'm ready to retire. And she said, that worked out great. I'm so glad. I don't know why it took so long. All right. And the question is, have you reached that point? Josh, we got any questions? Sure. All right, first, um, not sure I how I calculate my eligible retirement. I will be 49 years old in June and I'm class 1803. Do I have to be 65 or have 10 years with the company or both? Okay, you have to have 10 years and then you have to add up those two numbers. How many years of seniority do I have? And we're looking at company seniority. Look at your HI8, I believe, and it lists your various senioritys. You're looking for the one that says COMP, C-O-M-P, COMP seniority. And that number, it has to be a minimum of 10. You have to have 10 years of seniority. But if that number plus your age, you add those two together, for some reason, instead of calling them years, they call them points. I don't know. So uh, if both of those numbers add up to 65 or more, uh, then you are you are good to go. You can you're back to am I ready to retire? But again, if your age plus your years equals sixty five, but you don't have the ten years, you yeah. still need the yeah. ten years. And and looking looking at the numbers you put in that question, you don't have ten years yet, um, and you also don't have sixty five points yet. But I've got good news for you. Every year. You not only get a year closer, you get two years closer because we give you a year credit on your seniority and we give you a year credit on your age. So each year gets you two more points. So, which is probably easier to explain than two. Each year gives you two years, but yeah, two more points. So yes, you're not ready, but you're, you're on your way. All right. Um. How many days advance to notify and apply for pension payments well i think we actually are going to go over pensions a little bit later 65 point plan right for pension we'll talk about that later but for notification to the company do there, you want yeah. me to yes go let's that? go over that one yeah so if you're going to notify the company um, that you plan to retire um, the minimum they require is two weeks notice um, so usually we recommend that you notify your um, crew manager, the name has changed recently. Who's that? Your crew manager, supervisor, flight service manager, whatever you want to call them, but crew manager is the uh, new speak for that. <laughs> so crew manager, notify them two weeks out. Between 30 days and two weeks is a good rule of thumb. So um, that way 
you really in the grand scheme of things when you're doing your planning notifying your crew manager is the last of the important things that you do before you notify your crew manager you can request your pension paperwork if you have a pension because you can do that 90 days out and if you're eligible for medicare you can start that process 60 days out that's the best time to start that process so you work on your income piece, then you work on what you're going to do about insurance, and then 30 days out, you notify your crew manager and let them know that you're going to retire. You say, um, for instance, you know, March 30th is going to be my last day as an active member. April Fools, not fooling, is going to be my first day as a retiree. And then um, so I want you to follow up with an email to their AA email address so they have the, that information in writing that you're requesting retirement on a certain day. So it's very simple. There's not a form you have to fill out. There's not paperwork you have to do. Um, the pension paperwork, if you have a pension, is separate from your retirement notification. So um, anyway, and then we'll talk more about the pension a little bit later in the presentation. All right, we're good to continue. Yep, what can you tell us about what you get in retirement? Okay, what do you get in retirement? Well, you get your travel privileges. You get paid for your vacation and sick time. You get a retirement gift. And you get the status of being an American Airlines retiree. Um, you also get the option to purchase that really expensive medical insurance if you're separating between the ages of 55 and 65 and eligible for the 65 point plan. Um, we'll discuss that and other options later on in the presentation. Okay, so travel privileges. Well, you get your D1, D2R, D2P, D3, AA20, and 20% off Advantage tickets. Your D1s are regular D1s, so guess what? They don't have an R after them. When you retire and you get the same number of D1s that you had as an active employee. Um, all of your non-rev travels booked through the non-rev travel plan are on the AA retiree site. You'll be going to the AA retiree site for everything you need in retirement rather than jet med. It's www.retirees.aa.com. Um, Service charges and taxes will be charged to your credit card, just like they are now. And a pro tip is if you have someone traveling on your passes, have them put their own credit card number in so you don't get zinged for their travel fees. I see you met my dead sister. Okay. <laughs> or, or my own. <laughs> All right, so Zed Travels booked through um, my ID travel on the AA retiree site. Um, unfortunately, there is no longer jump seat authority and you can't use KCM any longer. That sucks. Um, there are some non-RAV non friendly travel agencies. We were talking about those cruises before. So Perks and Dargall are two of them that give you pretty good discounts on cruises. And we hear a lot about the retirees that are taking advantage of those benefits. Um, also, if you're considering retiring in the next six months to a year and your uh, TSA pre-check and global entry come up, you might consider getting it paid for by the company one more time before you retire. So obviously this depends on timing, but you know, if you're doing some long-term planning, something you might want to think about. All right, sick time and vacation pay. So your unused sick time, is paid out at a paltry rate of $8.65 per sick hour, which is not nearly as much as if you were to use it for a legitimate reason prior to your retirement. So we always recommend that you use your sick time for a legitimate reason before you retire. And really once you reach our age, there are certainly things you can use that sick time for that are very legitimate. So there you go. All right, so your unused and accrued vacation is paid out at the contractual rate, which is four hours per day at your rate of pay, as long as you're vac you have at least seven days of vacation. If for some reason you have less than seven days, six days or less of vacation, then uh, it's paid out at three and a half hours per day at your rate of pay. 
Um, the vacation is not eligible when you retire for the company 401k match and contribution. However, it is eligible for your employee contribution uh, deduction into your 401k. So, so if you want to change your 401k um, you know, election to putting in like 100% between when your last paycheck is issued and you get paid out for your vacation, a lot of people do that to get another good payment into their 401k. It's just an option, but it's something that um, can be useful for some people. All right, so I just said that and now it's there. All right, next, you get a retirement gift. Fabulous, woohoo. Um, you do want to remind your flight service manager uh, within the last 30 days, you know, probably when you're notifying them that you're going to retire, that they will meet, they remind them to uh, request your retirement gift at the same time. Uh, usually it comes about 30 days after you retire, so don't expect it to be there right away. Um, the catalog comes with a commemorative certificate, shows your years of service, and the option is kind of like a mini Sky Mall, has an option to uh, choose between a wide array of dust collectors, uh, glass plaques, a few little charms from Tiffany's and so on, so there's some okay options in there. And here is one of them, the Crystal Tail American Airlines. There you go. You know, I mean, I've always thought it important to have an attractive tail around my house. Some people think that's important. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Also, your status will be changing. So you're going to be going from Sky Goddess to, at least if you're me and Patrick, Cat Rancher. I know. Um, so some of the changes that go with that, um, you're going to submit an online request for your retiree ID. Now, the retiree ID, people get all worried because they think, oh, no, you know, I don't have my retiree ID. I'm retiring and I want to take a trip in the first week after I retire. I'm going off on a fabulous post-retirement, you know, trip to Europe or something. Well, you don't need your retiree ID in order to travel. So um, you travel, um, you use it for discounts, basically, like your FedEx discount, hotels, rent cars, stuff like that. Um, in order to travel, you need your government issued ID. So your passport, your driver's license, your state issued ID card, that's what you need in order to travel. It's nice to have the retiree ID because then the flight attendants on board might you know, see that you're a retiree and be extra nice to you, but if you don't have it, no big deal. All right, so um, access to the AA retirees website is one of the perks of retirement, and it um, has basically benefits information. It has uh, your non rev travel planner. It has perks, deals, and discounts, all kinds of good stuff like that. It also has access to the payroll information, your employee pay portal or um, e-pays or paperless pay for archive things from before um, October 15th of 2020. Now you have that because, you know, Uncle Sam still wants to be paid and you might need it for your tax information. However, if you want to keep your sequence information, that's not accessible on the retirees website. So if for some reason you want a record of your sequences for the past few years, go ahead and print that up prior to your retirement. All right, if you're not able to retire, guess what? You can just quit. You may not get all the same benefits as a retiree, but hey, here's how it works. You just, uh, when you feel that, like you just can't do it any longer, you notify your crew manager, um, give them your notification, try to give at least the two weeks. Your vacation is going to be paid out at the contractual rate. However, um, Oh, if you're legacy AA and you qualify for a pension, you contact Fidelity to find out when and how you can start that pension. If you're a legacy US flight attendant and you're not already taking your PBGC pension, you would contact the PBGC and uh, find out when you can start that pension. Um, since you're not actually qualified for the 65 point plan and not a retiree, um, you're not going to be paid out for your sick time and your sick time is lost. So again, even if you're going to quit, you could use that sick time before 
you leave for a legitimate reason. So keep that in mind. All right, any questions? All right. How and when do I apply for retirement? I can retire in August of this year. I will have 10 years of service and I meet the age qualification of at least 55 years old. Okay, so as I mentioned before, you just notify, there's not really an application process. You just, I always think it's a good idea to verify because sometimes those numbers are a little bit fiddly. So if you call the team member services number, which is 1-800-447-2000, and you follow the prompts for retirement services, they will tell you exactly when you're eligible for the 65 point plan. So once you reach that date, you notify your manager, hey, I'm gonna retire. I'm, I'm gonna not, uh, yeah, this is retiring, not quitting. So I'm gonna retire um, on such and such a date. Um, it, one day is gonna be my last day as an active employee and the next day is gonna be my first day as a retiree. Then you follow up with an email to their AA email. So that's pretty much it. Once you meet, meet the age and uh, years of service requirement. Right. Um, what is a retirement ID? Can I still go out to the airport through TSA and have coffee with a friend? Well, the retirement ID doesn't really get you through security. You need your government issued ID to that. And also for that, and also the um, travel guide says that you can't just book a ticket to go through security. So really, you know, you can't just create a ticket to go through and have coffee with a friend. However, if you were planning to go and then those plans change, you know, that sometimes happens, so. Will we still be able to pass ride on JetBlue, Delta, Southwest, et cetera, the same way we do now? So not exactly the same way. Um, no, you you are eligible for um, retiree. retiree travel on other airlines, but it's not the uh, jump what we call jump seat travel on other airlines. You you have to go to the uh, other airline travel booking, which is my ID travel, and it knows you're retired. So it will show you what your deals are on those other airlines as a retiree. And it will explain the process. Right. Do I have to go to the ticket counter? Do I have to book it in advance? And how do I do that? Right, but it's not the free pass travel that you're accustomed to. All right. Um, if you consider retiring instead of attending your next CQ in March 2025, is there a strategy for bidding vacation, going into grace CQ months, staying on payroll, et cetera? Well, you're not required to attend CQ when you're in your vacation month. So, I mean, that could be a strategy for extending it, but a lot of, what a lot of people don't realize is that you are legal to fly in your base month and in your grace month, and you don't actually go QI until the end of your grace month. So if you want to retire, you could fly in your base month and your grace month and tell your manager, I'm going to retire at the end of my grace month. Legally, for the FAA, you are allowed to re, uh, to fly in both of those months. It's after that that you couldn't fly anymore. So, um, if your if training department were to put training on your schedule and you've given your manager notification of your intention to retire, you can call your manager and they can call the training department and have that training removed from your schedule. And a lot of people do that. We talk to a lot of people who that's. They, want, they don't want to do training again, so they want to fly as long as they can without doing training again. So that's uh, either birthdays, uh, seniority anniversaries, or uh, trying not to do another CQ training. You are a, a lot of the three main reasons for <laughs> our dates that people choose when to retire. I have 18 vacation days and want to retire before I use them. How is it calculated uh, what the payout is? It, it's more than seven days, so you will get paid uh, four hours of flight pay for each day of vacation. But I also want to point out that you're talking about the 18 days that are left that you bid last year. Think about it. You're bidding right now. Your let's assume it's 35 days. You've been around long enough to have 35 days. You're bidding right now for those 35 days somewhere up and coming. You'll get the pay for those as well. So in addition to the 18, you get the 35, but wait, there's more. 
You also flew January and February and accrued vacation days in January, February, 2020. You'll get paid for those days as well. <laughs> so you may get a substantial uh, payout uh, when they cash out your vacation. As a matter of fact, that's one of those uh, pro tips that you need to think about. Would I like to have a big lump sum check when I retire? We'll push all your vacation days down until next year sometime and then retire in February or March and you'll get two years worth of vacation payout which is, you know, like $18,000 right now. So that's cool. Um, or if you'd rather burn them up as much as you can uh, so that you don't have to fly at the tail end, your choice. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going into my 12th year here and I'm 69 years old and I'm hoping to get full travel benefits as well. Thank you for uh, taking these questions. You're good because I, even I can do that math. That 12 and 69 is more than 65. It's more than 10 years of flying. So you can retire tomorrow and you will have a full unlimited D2R pass travel. All right, we are good to continue. All right, <clears throat> let's talk about income. What about income? Well, um, in retirement, you're going to need multiple buckets of, in of income. Um, I like, for instance, you're going to need your 401k. That is the big, the big horse that's going to carry you through retirement. You may or may not have an IRA. Hopefully, you do. You will have Social Security. Good Lord willing, and the Congress don't don't fail. Um, and uh, you'll have savings. And we'll talk about savings. There's several different looks to savings. It may not just be the money you have down in the credit union. And uh, you'll have a pension if applicable. And if you've got all of those, you it's kind of like a five-legged stool. It's very stable. And if one of those legs gets kicked out from underneath you, you still have the other four. What do I mean gets kicked out? Well, let's look, let, let's pick on Social Security. What if the US Congress were to say, you know what, we need to fix Social Security. And we notice that you saved money in a tax deferred 401k, or we notice that your employer got a, a tax uh, deduction for putting money into a pension. So you've already gotten some help from us. So we're going to reduce your Social Security. <laughs> they wouldn't do that. Let them, let them be light. Oh, yeah. You remember when Social Security used to be 65 um, that you would uh, uh, get Social Security and now it's 67 or somewhere in between there, depending on what year you were born? Yeah, that happened back because Congress, back when Ronald Reagan was president, uh, decided that they were going to balance the budget by moving your uh, full retirement age for Social Security to age 67. Um, it worked, they uh, balanced the budget, at least that's what they claimed in all of their uh, campaign ads. And- um, I think they really took some of my money. I think they did too. And I guess they figured out that uh, by, by the time we figured out how they'd screwed us, they'd be dead. And they were right, they're all dead, but I'm still pissed off about it. But every time I look at this list, I am incredibly grateful that I am in a unionized workforce where the union cares about what happens to their retired members. Because we have all of these options through our, uh, that, that the union is fighting for. And I contrast that with the over 50% of Social Security recipients that that's all they got. That's I mean, what, scary. That's scary. What kind of security is there when your entire financial future is dependent on the US Congress? Good Lord, that's, that's crazy. So, hey, what about my 401k loan? Well, um, yeah, your first, you have a couple of options with your 401k loan. One is that you can uh, continue to pay back the loan on your current amortization schedule. Now you don't have a paycheck to take the money out of, so they're gonna uh, have you set up an ACH uh, withdrawal from your checking account to get that paid and you just continue on that. Another option is to stop making payments and the outstanding balance will become a distribution. Uh-oh, that sounds like a taxable occurrence. It is, um, which will be taxed as income and subject to penalty if you're not yet age 59 and a half. That's also a very bad option because that money is no longer tax sheltered. So yeah. Uh, one last thing to remember about the 401k is uh, your 401k will freeze solid for the first 30 days after your exit from the company. So if you need money in that first 30 days out of your 401k, you might want to consider rolling money out of it, uh, you know, into an IRA or, or just, you know, take a distribution on it prior to leaving because it is going to be frozen solid during that first 30 days of retirement. 
I also want to point out that if you need money out of your 401k during the first 30 days of retirement, you may not yet be ready. You might want to talk to that financial planner a little more. Um, with the 401k, you can roll your 401k into an IRA. Uh, you can take it and roll it into a new I, new 401k. Okay. Say you retire and you go get a job down at Walmart. Welcome to Walmart. Welcome to Walmart. Um, yeah, you you have the option to roll your American Airlines uh, 401k into their 401k, and uh, they're going to be happy if you do that uh, because the price that the employees pay for the 401k goes down with size. So the bigger the 401k group the lower your administrative fees are individually. Or you can just leave it with Fidelity where it is now and manage it the same way through the uh, fidelity.com slash AA, or no, netbenefits.com slash AA. Too many URLs. <laughs> hey, what about your IRA? Well, there's a pre-tax and a post-tax, the Roth IRA, which was the original Roth. We now have the Roth 401k, but this was the original one. Um, there are a couple of issues with the uh, the, IRA, for instance, in 2024, if you make more than $146,000, uh, you are not eligible to add money into your IRA at all. I know, I know. I had a, a neighbor call me uh, a couple of weeks ago and say, hey, they won't let me make contributions to my IRA. I've got to take it all back out. I'm like, that's because you made too much money. Mm -hmm. I mean, river. I mean, really, yeah. Or 2400, uh, 240000 if you're married. Uh, and uh, you'll have conversion options. Right now, you can convert your 401, you can uh, roll your 401k into an IRA. And if you're still working, you can roll it back. But uh, once you retire, you can, it's a one way door. You can only roll your money out of a 401k into an IRA. You can't roll it back once you've retired. And you will get an awful lot of people that tell you that's a really great idea. Um, that uh, the, uh, there are so many more things you can do in an IRA. And I always, when I talk to those people, I say, what? I've got, I've got every investment option in the world pretty much through my 401k with one exception. I cannot buy American Airlines stock in my 401k. And I'm here to tell you that's probably a really good idea to not buy American Airlines stock, even in your, when you're not in your 401k. So um, yeah. The, the people encouraging you to roll it into an IRA, make sure you understand what you're doing. They're very different products. The 401k is a function of federal law. The IRA is a function of state law, and therefore the protections are different. Um, for instance, if you get sued and they take everything you've got, they can't touch your 401k because it has a risk of federal protection. The state rules for your IRA are going to be different, and they're different by every state. I think it's Michigan that allows you to keep the first $50,000 in your IRA in order to sue you against the rest. So uh, the way people inherit money is different in a 401k than an IRA. They're, they're not, one's not necessarily better than the other, but they're different. And make sure you know what you're doing if you choose to convert your 401k into an IRA. Questions? Hey, Kim, do we have questions? We don't have any specific 401k questions. All right. Today. No one submitted any. If you do have some and you didn't put them in, um, we can answer them at the end of the presentation. But for now, since there aren't any, we'll just keep going. Well, let's talk about Social Security. Kim, yeah. what can you tell us about Social Security? Okay, Social Security. Always heard my grandparents talking about <laughs> Social Security. Never thought I would be sitting here talking about Social Security. Go figure. All right, it may be taken as early as age 62 and as late as age 70. There's no increase in your social security amount after age 70, so um, don't wait after age 70, start taking it. Um, that website is www.ssa.gov and there's a lot of really useful information on there. Married couples have some very complicated decisions to make as far as when and how to draw their Social Security. Um, a single person, you have nine different options. Married uh, people, that increases exponentially to 81 different options possible for taking your Social Security. That's why we say talk to a Social Security advisor. We are not versed in all of these options. So. I'm getting ready to think about some of those options myself because my husband's social security age and 
I'm getting closer to the age where I might be able to take part of his social security. So there you go. I need to talk to an advisor. It's option 57. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. All right. So um, you can go to your local, you know, phone book, Google it, whatever, to find out um, who can assist with social security uh, information in your state, in your area. Also, there are apps you can put on your phone if you're a geek like Patrick and want to know how to optimize your social security benefits. And he's already got it on there. I'm going to ask him some questions. All right. So early social security at age 62. We get a lot of people asking about that, thinking they might want to take it while they're still working. And there are some definite pros and cons about taking early social security. So one pro is that if you get it's usually better if you have to leave the company early for some reason, you get more years of payments if you need that many, you know, or if you're in one of those groups where maybe in your family, people don't live that long, you know, you started early, you're going to get more years of payments. Um, another pro, you can get the money if you need it now. So, you know, something happened to health issue or you need to look after a family member, you can't keep working because of that, you can get the money now if you need it. So um, that is an option. A, a con is you're going to have lower payments for the rest of your life. So once you start your Social Security, you're going to keep it at that amount, unless there's a cost of living increase, but um, your basic number is not going to change for the rest of your life. Another con is that you are subject to income limits. So if you're going to take early Social Security and you're still working, um, you're subject to, to income limits until you hit your full Social Security age, which for most people these days between age 66 and 67, you know. Um, so your income limits for 2024, if you can make up to 22,320 and still get your uh, regular, your early Social Security with no deductions. However, if you make more than that, you're going to deduct $1 benefits for every $2 you make over that amount. So if you're still working and you're just flying the hard 40, you're going to make more than that amount. Yeah. So, you know, really think about whether you want to take that early Social Security. All right. So the breakdown point, the breaking point for when, you know, deciding to take Social Security early or late, it's kind of that average age of death. So here's a little chart to illustrate that kind of when should I start? So someone, the blue line person starts it early and the red line person starts it later. So if you're going to live longer, like my grandmother who got a car in her late 80s, you know, maybe you want to start it later and then you can enjoy a higher benefit for longer. If you have a family history like Patrick's uncles, you know, who turned gray and maybe didn't ever find out if they were going to go bald or not, you might want to start it earlier because you might get more benefits that way before you die. The trouble is you can't really know. You're just making your best possible guess. All right. Full Social Security at your normal Social Security retirement age. So there are special income limits for the year you reach your, it's called Social Security Normal Retirement Age, SSNRA. And um, for the month before your birthday month, you can make a little bit more that year and not be subject to the income limits. So a lot of people want to know, well, what's that year for me? Well, here it is, you know, anyone born in 1960 or later, it's 67. And then there's a gradual, you know, 66 in so many months um, prior to that. So, all right. What counts as earnings for Social Security? Patrick, you're the earnings guy. Yeah, you know, I've been thinking about that $22,000. What's included in that? twenty? What is earnings? I mean, obviously, if I'm flying the hard 40, I'm earning more than 22,000. But you know, but what if what if I hit the lottery and I'm just staying at home? Uh, what counts as earnings? Earnings include income from wages or net earnings from self-employment if you have that little job, side job going. Uh, that includes everything that you normally think of as wages, but we call a different name, bonus, commission, severance pay. But I've got good news for you. Earnings does not include investment income. Pensions, you get a pension, it doesn't count toward that $22,000. Capital gains, inheritance, that doesn't count toward the $22,000. Uh, dividends and capital gains 
won't negatively affect your Social Security benefits directly. So if I'm living the high life, I'm 62, and I'm just going to go ahead and start taking my Social Security because I'm living on my, my uh, savings, um, I'm fine because I don't have $22,000 in earnings. So that's, that's what earnings are. Uh, are there taxes on Social Security? Oh, you best believe it. However, the first 15% of your Social Security is always tax-free. Bill Gates' Social Security, the first 15% is tax-free, although he doesn't know it. <laughs> um, you may pay tax of, on 0, 50, or 85% of the rest, depending on your income. And remember, that's just how much of that is going to be taxed, not what the tax rate is. So if you earn between zero and 25%, 25,000 as a single, we don't tax your social security at all. If you earn more than 34,000 as a single, we tax the 85%, because remember that first 15% is always tax rate. We tax that 85%. Um, is there state tax on social security? Yes, there is in 37 states. Your social security is tax free, but in 13 states uh, that do tax some or all of your social security. Why do I put this list up here? Because you should think about that. You know, you're yeah. going to move somewhere. What happens if you move to West Virginia? Well, now you're going to have less income at home uh, at the end because West Virginia taxes your Social Security. Maybe you should think about a state that doesn't tax Social Security. So, yeah. Um, savings. Let's talk about savings. So. In addition to cash, stocks, and bonds, you have hidden savings, or yeah, what I call hidden savings, that uh, you have your home equity. And I don't necessarily mean um, like a home equity line of uh, a, a reverse mortgage, but there are things like a home equity line of credit. Um, maybe you can sell your four bedroom suburban ranch and downsize into a nice small two bedroom townhouse where you don't have to worry about mowing the lawn or painting the exterior. Um, and that would be taking some of your home equity and living on that. Life insurance. And I don't mean what you get when you kill your spouse with a good alibi. No. No. Uh, there what are, you get from American Airlines. Yeah, no, yeah, or the, or the American Airlines, yes. Um, the life insurance, some life insurance, not the life insurance from American, but some life insurance I call whole or uh, whole life, uh, to build cash value. And because there's some cash value there, they will let you borrow from that cash value because they'll take what you owe them back when you die out of, out of your uh, amount there. And then we've got pensions. Kim, what can you tell us about pensions? Okay, so if you are one of the flight attendants that's still lucky enough to have some sort of a pension, um, it's going to be dependent on where you started your career. So the carrier you work for when you earn that pension as far as when and how you can take the pension. So there's a lot of different options here. So we used to have the Legacy US Airways group and the Legacy AA group primarily. There's a few others in there. You might've worked for Eastern, TWA. So there's a few others that may still have pensions. Um, but generally speaking, US Airways, does it one way. And if you started your career at US Airways, well, we could have started your career at PSA, Allegheny, Piedmont, Trump Shuttle, or the original US Airways. So there's still some variation within this group. Um, if you started at Shuttle, your early pension age is age 52 and your full pension age is age 62. Um, with all of these groups, you can now take your pension while you're working. So early or late, but if you take it early for all of these options, there's a 3% per year reduction for every year you take it prior to the early pension, I mean the full pension age. So if you take it at 52 as opposed to 62, there's a 3% per year reduction in the full value of your pension. Um, so keep that in mind. You will be getting it for more years, kind of like the early Social Security we talked about. So for Piedmont, Allegheny, and original U.S. Air, the early pension age is age 55. The full pension age is age 62. If you started your career at PSA, the early um, pension age is age 55, and the full pension age is age 65. All right, for the legacy AA pensions, um, 
you have to have at least uh, 15 years of retirement eligibility service when you retire and you have to retire and in most cases, there's one small exception that we'll talk about a little bit, but in most cases you, with a legacy AA pension, you can't take your pension while you're still working. So the early pension age is age 55 and the full pension age is age 60 for the flight attendant pension. So that three year, 3% 3 per year prior to the age 60 still applies here as well. Um, so as I mentioned before with Legacy AA, for most people, there's no double dipping. Okay, what is double dipping? Well, um, the people with PG, PBGC pensions, so that would be Eastern, TWA, Legacy US Airways, their pensions went to the PBGC as a result of bankruptcy. So these people can take their pension while they're working, once they hit the early age or the full pension age or anywhere in between. There used to be a restriction on taking your pension early. You had to wait till the full pension age came along, but that went away on June 1st of 2021. So those uh, early you know, deductions still apply if you're double dipping. And there's no deductions at the full pension age if you want to wait, but a lot of people just decide they're going to take it now. All right, pension options. Patrick, how many different ways can I take my pension? Good question. How many options do I have? How many have? options do I have? Now, how many different ways can I get my pension money? All right, there are three basic ways you can get your pension money. The first is a single life annuity, and the PPGC calls this a straight life annuity. Fortunately for us, the acronym SLA is the same because we're an airline, we run on jet fuel, caffeine, and acronyms. Um, so and the second way is that you can share your pension with someone else, and I do remind you it's nice to share. And the third way is a minimum number of checks. So uh, if you're legacy AA, there's a fourth option, and that's more upfront, less later. Let's look at that. The single life annuity. You get a check every month until you're dead, and it stops. And, and that's the uh, uh, a pension, a, a payment every month is an annuity. And for life, uh, you're alive. Uh, so we're going to call that a life annuity, one life yours. And that's where we get the phrase single life annuity or a straight life annuity. And that SLA is the normal form of benefit. What do I mean by normal? Well, normal has a couple of different ways. In this context, it means that most single people take the single life annuity. And uh, an awful lot of married people take the single life annuity as well. But uh, by normal, I also mean that it's the, it's the number that's used when calculating all the other benefits out there. Remember when you, we were talking about how much you have to plan to save in order to have the goal, the target number? When the employer is trying to figure out how much they have to put in your pension so that there's enough there when you get ready to retire, they have to make some assumptions. How long are gonna work? How much you're going to make and more importantly what form of benefit are you going to take what and, and it is they assume you're going to take the single life annuity that's the normal form of benefit and once they've got that um, that value of the sla determines all the other payment options well what about those other options uh, let's look at um, the uh, pension for your life and then someone else's life as well they'll get an annuity after you're dead. Uh, nobody, nobody gets the um, two checks that you get a check until you're dead, that they survive you, so they get a check and we call that the survivor annuity. And remember, it's still the same big pile of money, we're just cutting it up differently. And so you can choose to leave them 50 to 100% of what you get, not your SLA amount, but your share of the joint annuity. But here's the problem, the more you leave them, the less you get. Well, crap, I don't want to take less, but I guess I have to leave something for Bozo because otherwise they're going to be living under a bridge while I'm dead. So, all right, well, I'll bite the bullet. I'll take less so that they've got something after I'm gone. But what if I do that and they die first? Uh, I'm stuck at the lower monthly amount. I could have had a higher amount with the SLA. Um, I think the technical phrase is you're screwed. Yeah, but there is a way to cover that risk. 
And flight attendants have another option called the pop-up option. And what the pop-up option says is by taking a slightly lower amount each month, you cover the risk that the joint to do it annuitant dies first. With a pop-up option, if the joint annuitant dies first, we pop you back up to that single life annuity amount for the rest of your life as though you never actually had the joint survivor. And most people are gonna take one of these two options, uh, but there is another option, and that is the guaranteed period certain. It applies to so very few people, but we'll tell you about it anyway. And that is you get checks for a minimum number of 10, 15, or 20 years, or if you're with a, a PBGC, it's five, 10, or 15 years. Why would I do that? Because I'm gonna get met less money just to make sure that those checks come for say 20 years. Well, you may do that because you're pretty sure you're gonna die soon. And if you plug in someone who's like really young as the joint annuitant, the checks bill will get really small. By saying, I want them to only come for 20 years and not for the survivor's full life, because you plug a 20 year old in there, they're gonna get checks for 80 years. And so the, the number is going to get really small. By limiting it to, say, 20 years, the reduction isn't very big. Like I say, there's not a whole lot of people that that would apply to, but yeah, uh, that, that option is out there if you need it. And uh, Legacy AA has a fourth option, and that's the level income option. And uh, that's going to be more upfront and less later. Again, not a lot of people would benefit from it. Some people that might benefit from that are the people that left um without a lot of planning either they they just said okay i'm done i gotta go or um they took the sudden out sudden out what's the sudden out and the sudden out is when the union rep and your supervisor meet you excuse me not supervisor what is it now uh crew manager the union rep and the crew manager meet you on the jet bridge <laughs> the union rep says i got your retirement i recommend you take it yeah you were planning on leaving but you are leaving or worse, your doctor says you can't go back. Uh, you didn't plan. And so now you know that once um, the Social Security kicks in, that Social Security and your pension, you're going to be okay, maybe. But right now, you don't have Social Security. So American says, we have, a, we have a deal for you. We'll give you more now. And then once you reach Social Security age, either 62 or your full uh, Social Security normal retirement age, we'll drop it down so that it kind of levels it all out. I don't think it's actually sound. I don't think it's a good deal. But if you need money because you got to pay the rent, it's, it's out there. It's good to know that it's available. So how do I apply for my pension? No earlier than 90 days before you want to start your pension. Oh, I need it. I need the information more sooner than that. Sorry. 90 days. No earlier than 90 days before you start your pension. Um, you're going to with LAA, you request the packet of papers to request your pension, which we call a kit. And you can do that over the phone by calling the Pension Service Center. You can do it online um, and select the Collect tab and follow the prompts for that. Uh, if you're uh, with a PBGC or LUS, you want to contact the PBGC directly at the 800-400 number, which you're very familiar with, or the PBGC.gov. Are there taxes on pensions? Absolutely. Uh, you pay federal income tax, I know, as ordinary income, the 10 to 37 percent rate, whatever you're in. How do I know what tax rate I'm in? Ha! Here's the chart. If you make zero to eleven thousand dollars, you only pay 10 percent uh, tax on, on the taxable amount. If you make uh, 578 thousand or more, you're not a flight attendant. Oh, wait. <laughs> uh, uh, you're you're going to be in the 37 percent bracket. So you will pay taxes on pension. But here's the good news. Remember, not everything you get in uh, retirement is going to be considered taxable income. So you, you, may, you may be in a lower bracket that you anticipated. So your mileage may, oh, uh, and remember we're talking about some, uh, some states don't tax Social Security, some states don't tax pensions. 14 states uh, all, uh, will tax your pension or a portion of it. So again, think about what state you're going to live in. Remember, your mileage may vary. Uh, these numbers are used for some mythical flight attendant and not for you. Kim, do you have any pension tips for us? I do have a few pension tips, so let's go through them. Um, your pension kits can be requested from Fidelity for AA or from the PBGC um, no more than 90 days out from your presumed retirement date. You know, some people say, hey, I'm going to retire on May 1st. 
and they request their pension kit and then they say, oops, I changed my mind, you know, so, but um, generally speaking, you want to request your pension kit about 90 days out from your retirement date. Um, your pensions always start on the first of the calendar month. So um, you want to remember to be done with your last trip before the end of the month because a fly for trip that keeps you on payroll is going to keep you from getting paid your pension. You can't be paid, well, if you're at Legacy AA, you can't be paid your pension while you're still working. Um, so keep that in mind and drop those trips or just don't bid them in the first place. You should be removed with PBS, but we can't always promise that that coding is going to be done in time. So just to be cautious. All right, more pension tips. You do need to have, if you are married and divorced, when you are working for the company and earning those pension credits, you will need uh, copies of divorce decrees and, and quadros for those periods of time. All so, of them? All of them. I know. Yeah, sure. I'm going to have more than ones I have to come up with. Yikes. So um, if you don't have the divorce paperwork, uh, you may send in the rest of the kit, but your your pension payments will be delayed until they have all that paperwork because you're going to tell them, hey, my ex doesn't get any of my pension, but they're not going to be believe it until they see it on the legal document, which is a divorce decree. So why don't they trust us? I just don't understand. I would never screw that horrible <laughs> awful ex. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, if you're a widow or a widower, you want to have a copy of the death certificate when you send in your pension uh, paperwork, just so they know that uh, they don't have to put you down for a 50% join in survivor when you could be getting the full single life in Moody. Um, also, um, the first month is always paid retroactively. I can't say that very well. Retroactively, when you receive your pension, um, usually four to six weeks, and it's getting a little bit better. So we might want to change that to two to four weeks uh, following your retirement. So say you were to retire on April 1st, you probably get your April and May pension payments around May 1st, on or around May 1st. So. All right, the Qualified Pre-Retirement Survivor Annuity. Like I explained this, it's a benefit for, for those uh, members that have legacy AA pensions. Um, so federal law says that your spouse automatically gets a 50% join in survivor annuity, an, um, annuity if you have a pension. However, um, this form, if you fill it out, allows you to leave your spouse up to a 100% annuity if you were to pass away prior to commencing your pension benefits. So this is a pre-retirement kind of a protection for you know your spouse if you're married and you have to be married. Unfortunately, you can't use the pre-retirement annuity option for anyone other than a spouse. And um, it has to be a spouse that you've been married to for at least 12 months. Um, the form can be found on the Fidelity Net Benefits uh, website in the form section. Or, um, and the flight attendants are the only work group at American that has this benefit and the company pays for it. Mm -hmm. It's a negotiated benefit. So uh, once again, uh, you have to be married at least 12 months. So no last minute uh, marriages right before retirement or anything. <laughs> All right, any questions? Pension right. questions. I think we have a few today. You take your pension when you're over a certain age and continue to be employed. That's a great question. And there's a long, complicated <laughs> answer. Uh, if you are, um, we have a PBGC pension. We talked about the double dipping. You can choose when you want to take it. Uh, and of course, all the early uh, pension uh, kicks or deductions kick in if you take it before your full retirement age with the PBGC. But the question is about LAA pensions. And the answer is for almost everybody, almost everybody, the answer is no. You have to be retired to take your pension. However, um, there is this weird little rule, IRS rule, that says your pension can never be more than your income. And where this rule came from is actually a cool thing. Um, there used to be some some uh, executives that would say, hey, 
I'm making a whole lot of money and I hate paying taxes. How about this? How about if you only pay me $50,000 well, a year while I'm working, and then when I'm retired, you pay me $2 million a year in retirement? And they, they, they thought that was a cool way to screw the government or the IRS out of taxes. And they went, oh, no, no, wait a minute. Your retirement can never be more than your, your pension can never be more than your income. And that's cool because we hate those people playing those kind of games. However, um, we now have people who've been flying long enough and their pensions have grown enough. What do you mean grown? They're frozen. Well, yeah, that's the other part of this is that if you fly past 70 and a half, 70 and a half, 70 and a half, and a half. Uh, because you haven't started taking your pension yet, because you can't, uh, your pension starts to grow. It's delayed pension, delayed uh, ben uh, benefit. Just kind of like if you wait and don't take Social Security to your normal Social Security age, your Social Security will grow. If you don't take your pension at 70 and a half, because you can't, uh, your pension starts to grow again. But because it's growing, now your pension might get to be bigger than what you're earning. So if you're flying the 40 hours and only bringing home, say, 50, 60,000 a year, and all of a sudden your pension grows past that number, the bells go off down at the IRS, the red lights come on and say, ah, this, uh, you can't screw us out of, of your uh, income rule kicks in. And they tell American, you have to send that person their pension. You have to make them start their pension so it stops growing. And it's not like, if you dip down below for one month, no, no, no. the IRS does an audit. Three year look back. Three, yeah, three year look back of your income. And if consistently for three years, your income and you're over age 70 and a half, and your income is below what your, I mean, your income, yeah, is below what you would be getting from your pension on a monthly basis. That's when the bells go off. And the company at that point does not have a choice because the IRS says, you have to let this make this person start taking their pension. So one of the common questions we get is, well, what what age is that? I don't know because some people are 80 and flying, 25 of them, but they're flying high time, and therefore their income is more than their pension. Some are 80 and flying low time, and therefore their pension could be more than their income, and they fall into this trap. But remember, it's a three year look back. And some people are 80 and started flying after the pensions went away. Yeah. So they don't they even have, have a pension. pension right? yeah. So you so. just don't know. There's difference. It's apples and oranges. There's yeah. not one set of rules for everybody, unfortunately. Yeah. And some people say, well, that sounds really fun. I'm 80. I'd like to start my pension. Not your choice. The IRS determines. And last I heard, we have like four or five people. I mean, it's a small number of people. It's growing. There's, our, 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 we're applying uh, uh, populations getting older, but there are not very many people in that bucket. I'm in IDF, uh, Dallas International, and so I fly with some of them occasionally, but there are not very many. I think the last few years we've had about six or seven. Oh, know, wow. It's just maybe. growing like crazy. Yeah. And, you know, like, like a couple of them have retired recently. Yep, so, yep. Uh, and here's one of the weird things about that. Uh, the reason the IRS makes you start your, start your pension is so it stops growing. So you may look at that and go, man, I, if I don't take my pension until I'm 150 years old, it's going to be huge. Yeah, except that sometime before you get to 150, uh, this rule is going to kick in and catch it. So, uh, yeah. But yeah, so, uh, yes, uh, there are a few people out there, LUS, getting their pension and flying, but they're not many, and it's not you. You mean LAA? Uh, LA. Yeah, Elliot, LA, LA. And you can't just call and say, I want to start taking no. my pension. The company will contact you when that happens. Yeah. And if you looked at your pension estimate and you were planning on flying a few years beyond that, and then that magic time hits, they're not going to let you choose, unfortunately. Yeah. So. And so, uh, I mean, the only the only way I could pro tip to gain that is you look and you say, oh, my pension is getting close to what I'm flying. If you fly more, then that three year average will grow higher than your pension. But eventually there's just a limit as to how much you can fly. So. Was that a good complicated answer? That was a good complicated answer. All right. I guess call. I guess we're done. Oh, wait, no, there are more about questions. That issue. <laughs> are there any circumstances that would cause us to lose or have even further reduced pensions? Example, strike resulting in company lockout, bankruptcy, et cetera. Okay. 
Um, strength resulting in company lockout, you can't lose your pension uh, because they would do that in a heartbeat. So no, the law says they can't do that. Um, there are, uh, you know, there are some options in bankruptcy to get rid of the LAA pension. Uh, last time LAA went through a bankruptcy, they tried valiantly to get rid of the pension. They being the company. They being the company, yeah. yeah. They said, oh, Your Honor, we can't possibly survive on the other side of bankruptcy. We have to continue to pay these pensions. And so we looked at the numbers and the judge said, you're lying. And they wouldn't let the company terminate the pension and dump it on the PBGC. Could they try that again? No. Would they try that again? Absolutely. I mean, they, they are predictable if we go into bankruptcy, which we're not anywhere near right now, um, then they could try that. But they have to prove it, and they have not been able to prove it to this point. So I think there's a very small risk. But if we were to go to bankruptcy and the judge did make that determination that AA could dump the pensions on the PBGC, AA has continued to pay the PBGC premium. So our pensions are protected and would go to the PBGC right. if the judge did make that decision. Next question. Good questions today. Yeah. Is the payment amount of our frozen pension the same if we retire at 55 or 65? Meaning does the payment increase the longer we wait to retire? Okay, so we just talked about a small actuarial increase monthly kicking in after age 70 and a half. So between age 60, which is the full um, full benefit for the legacy AA pension, pension holders, um, and age 70 and a half, you don't see a change. And then after age 70 and a half, there's a gradual monthly increase. So um, between age 55 and 60, there's a reduction, which gets less and less the closer you get to age 60. Can I collect my pension while I'm working? I hear that other uh, flight attendants are doing that. I think I that- I think we just answered that. Right, so if you have a PBGC question, yes, by all means, you may do it. If you have a legacy AA pension and you fall into that, tiny loophole we just discussed, um, then you can. So this is interesting. If I'm receiving a small pension from US Airways, will I receive a pension from American? Uh, most likely not. Uh, when the companies merged, the uh, pension at American got frozen, and so we didn't take anybody new in. So if you were a legacy US air flight attendant that came over in the merger, I actually ran into somebody who quit U.S. Airways after vesting, so they have a U.S. Air pension, and they came to American in the, uh, it was 1998, and so they have a small U.S. Pe uh, uh, American pension as well, but there's only one that I've met that actually has both because they quit U.S. Airways and came to American. If you came over in the merger, you do not have an LAA pension. And I've talked to one or two people that quit U.S. Airways, and yeah. so they have a little Pension from we'll have to compare notes if you've got two, right? I think this next question is the same same question. Um, I work for U.S. Airways, this one. Um, yeah, collecting, collecting from, from PBGC. PBGC. So the, PB, the U.S. Airways pensions were frozen in 2005. So anyone who came to work for U.S. Airways after 2005 doesn't have a pension. And then the AA pensions were frozen in 2012, which was at the time that the, all the merge process started. So because the merge was completed after 2012, then nobody after 2012 has a pension from AA. So um, you had to have worked for AA before November, really before the beginning of 2012 because it takes a year to get vested in the pension plan. Right, so, right. And uh, that's not confusing enough if you work for America West, <laughs> you don't have either. Yeah, so. the poor America West people got a uh, really bum deal. Yeah. So, um, uh. Uh, after age 70, does our pension amount increase while we continue to work as a legacy A flight attendants? My understanding that there is no increase to our pension frozen up to age 70. I know we've talked about this a couple of times. Right, no, no. Um, increase up to age 70 and a half, and then after that, a gradual monthly actuarial increase, because I get a lot of people saying, calling and saying, I heard after I turn 70, my pension doubles. 
that's not how it works. So it's a very gradual increase. And if you work to 76, 78, 80, you might see a pretty big increase, but you know, it just depends. As we said before, it's a, it all depends on your pension, the size of it, how many years you worked before it was frozen, and all that plays into it. And looking at the estimate pensions page in good slide, it speaks of the designation of a surviving beneficiary, a spouse, non-spouse, or none. May I designate both my daughters as surviving beneficiaries in equal shares, 50% each, or am I limited to only one beneficiary? So I think AA. we need to talk about it's, a joint annuitant versus beneficiary. Yes. A joint, remember I talked about sharing with someone else that the joint annuitant and you get it for your life and then they get it for their life as well after your dad, the survivor annuity. If you've got more than one person, you can't calculate how much to pay them. That if I've got one survivor and in my book, they're gonna die at 83, I know how much to cut that and pile up and pay them. If I've got two survivors, I, you can't do the math. And so uh, you can only have one joint annuitant. However, Remember we talked about some of those other options, for instance, the uh, period certain of 20 years, guaranteed for 20 years, those have beneficiaries. And what the beneficiary is, it's not an annuitant, they're only gonna get the remainder of the 20 years after you're dead. So we call them a beneficiary and you can designate multiple beneficiaries in that, that circumstance. All right, we're good to continue. All right. Wow. <laughs> oh, uh, actually, one just came in. I'm from T. Uh, I'm from TWA. Do I have a pension with AA? Most TWA flight attendants, and it's uh, sort of complicated too. It depends on how much you were able to fly um, before and after furloughs, and then before the pension was frozen in 2012. So I'll give you an answer that applies to most TWA flight attendants. Have a small pension from TWA and a small pension from AA. There are maybe a few that really, if they came over on medical leave and then got furloughed and were not able to fly before the merge in 2012, they might not have a pension or they may have a, a, a really small pension, like, you know, one to $5,000 that would be paid out as a lump sum. And how can they find out? Um, they would call the Pension Service Center at Fidelity and okay. ask about their AA pension, and they would be able to give them all the details. Okay, yeah, great. If they have one, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Medical insurance, I think that's you. Oh, yeah, I, I really don't want to talk about that today. <laughs> it's a depressing subject. Okay, so medical insurance options after you retire. Uh, they're kind of uh, categorized by cost. So the first option is COBRA. See, it's got three dollar signs. It's pretty expensive. Um, the AA retiree medical insurance that we talked about, uh, even more expensive. That's why most people don't choose it. Um, the Affordable Care Act usually can be reasonable. So depending on whether you qualify for subsidies. Uh, and then Medicare, uh, that's most people's option. It's your only option if you're 65 or over or if you have Medicare due to a disability. And the old fashioned way, you can marry someone with insurance or already be married to someone with insurance and go on their insurance or die young, but that's really not an option. We're not going there. Okay, so let's talk about COBRA. COBRA is a way to continue the health coverage that you've had as an active employee um, into your retirement. And you do not have to reestablish your deductible or out of pocket, those are good things. Um, the bad thing is the participant pays the full cost and a 2% admin fee. So right now, what you're paying for your insurance as an active employee is subsidized up to 80% by the company. So you're paying 20% of the full cost now. It seems expensive, but it gets a lot more expensive after you retire. Um, so the coverage can last for up to 18 months and up to 29 months if you become eligible for Social Security disability. And it must be taken within the first 60 days of leaving the company. And it's a one time deal. So if you miss that 60 day window, you're not going to get COBRA, unfortunately. All right. So, 
COBRA can include medical, dental, vision, and your flex spending accounts. You can mix and match the coverage. So a lot of people, most people who are eligible for Medicare, so they don't take the COBRA medical, do elect to continue their dental and vision with COBRA for another 18 months. Because sometimes people find that the options for dental and vision once you retire are not as good as they should be. All right. Uh, once coverage begins, it's retroactive to the date you leave American. So even though you have that 60 days to sign up for it, you can't wait a month and then it starts a month later. Uh, your active insurance ends at midnight on your last day as an active employee and uh, your COBRA, if you elect it, would begin the next day. So the payments. It's very important with COBRA that you're not late with your payments. You can set up a direct debit, um, but your coverage will be dropped if you're late. So you want to be very conscious of that. Um, oh, and one last thing. If you're eligible for Medicare, COBRA is not considered to be creditable coverage for Medicare. So a lot of people are like, oh, I can take my time. I've got, you know, eight or nine months to sign up for Medicare. Let's, and well, technically you do, but COBRA is not considered creditable coverage. And Medicare actually does a check to see if you've had creditable coverage within the last 60 days before you start Medicare. So really, if you are eligible for Medicare because of your age or because of Social Security disability, you need to go ahead and get signed up for Medicare. Start the process about 60 days before you retire, so you have plenty of time to get the paperwork you need and get on Medicare, and it will be a smooth transition. COBRA is always secondary to Medicare, so if you wait thinking you're gonna use COBRA again, it's gonna pay as secondary, so it's gonna pay as though you have Medicare, whether you have signed up for Medicare or not. So. Don't do it. All right, so AA retiree medical insurance. It, uh, you must be between 55 and 65 at the time of your retirement and eligible for the 65 point plan. Um, the patient, the participant, not patient, but a lot of times the people that choose this are patients. The participant pays the full cost and the prices are uncapped. It actually doubled in 2015 and the cost is very unstable, which isn't appealing if you are retired and you're on a fixed income. So how much does it cost? Well, it's really good coverage. It's like the old standard medical plan if you're a former, if you're a legacy AA flight attendant. Great coverage, you know, 150 deductible $1,000 out of pocket it looks, it looks great and it is if you can afford to pay $2,098 per month. Yikes, it's expensive. So um, as a result, not very many people take this coverage. Ah, now that our emotional support animal has fainted at these costs, what are some other options for us? Well, there's the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and you go to www.healthcare.gov. Um, you might be eligible for tax credits or subsidies if your income is low enough. And um, another option is a company called Via Benefits. If you don't know where to look for those Affordable Care Act plans, if you're um, under the age of 65 when you retire, um, American Contracts with VIA Benefits, and you can call them to try and find some Affordable Care Act plans in your area. If you're over age 65, they will also help you find your Medicare plans. So um, we've got their information in the back of our retirement packet, good slide. So, um, and we've got those phone numbers as well. All right, Medicare. So this is your option if you're over 65. Now, one thing, if you're planning to work or you are working after the age of 65, it's good to know that you can remain on AA health insurance. You don't have to sign up for Medicare if you plan to work beyond the age of 65. Um, Medicare is comprised of Part A, which is the hospitalization part, and that's the part that's normally free for most people if you worked at least, what, 10 years or something yes, like yeah. that. Part B, which is your regular doctor's visits and labs, and then Part D, which is your drug, prescription drug coverage. Um, 
There are late enrollment fees. So if you retire, you leave the AA uh, benefits and you don't sign up for Medicare within 60 days, you could be subject to late enrollment fees. Keep that in mind, it's very important. Um, there's a form that helps you if you're working at past the age of 65, Medicare is going to want to know. They want proof that you've been uh, have, getting good coverage from your employer. And here's there's a form for that. It's called the Medicare Employment Verification Form or CMS L564. And you fill it out, you fax it to the company, and then they're going to snail mail it back to you. That's why I say start 60 days out because it might take a month for you to get this form back from the company. And then you'll still have a month left to talk to somebody, a Medicare broker, about your options and what you want to sign up for with Medicare. All right, more about Medicare. Um, your A, B, and D don't really have an out-of-pocket max. They have a deductible, but they don't have an out-of-pocket max. So if something serious happens, your out-of-pocket expenses could get really high. And that's why you want to sign up for a Medigap, which is also known as a Medicare Supplement Plan or a Medicare Advantage Plan. So let's talk a little bit about those. The Medigap policies, um, they, after you meet your out-of-pocket, they'll cover the 20% that you have to pay. Um, uh, there's 10 different Medigap plans available. And the AA retirees have an 11th option, which is a VIVA. It means it's a, an employee funded trust for retired airline workers. And we have a number that you can call about that VIVA on the APFA website. We don't know a whole lot about it, except that it's another option for retired airline workers. Um, the Part C Medicare, Medicare Advantage plan. So you would either choose a supplement plan or an Advantage plan, one or the other. These uh, Medicare Advantage plans are structured more like an HMO. They usually have a network of doctors that you have to go to. They might be really good if you're in a big metropolitan area, maybe not so good if you're out in the country and you don't have a lot of options and you want to see your same old doctor. So really talk to somebody that knows about Medicare and make sure you understand your choices before you sign up for one of these. Um, there you go. And you can also go to www.medicare.gov for more information. All right, so we've covered a lot of our important questions today. What do you need to retire? What do you get in retirement? What about income? So there's always a lot of little details that you need to look into that you may not have thought about. So we're gonna cover those. What else do I need to research things right now? So one thing you need to think about is life events. Um, your optional insurance, say you have pet insurance, can you keep that? Um, your dental insurance, flexible spending accounts, how does that work when I retire? Well, we're going to go through all that. So start starting with life events. Um, it's very important to remember that when you retire, it's your spouse or your partner's life event. So if you're going to go on their insurance, um, your retirement date is the beginning of the life event to add you to their coverage. So don't miss that life event if you're going to go on your spouse's insurance benefits. Um, they usually have between 30 and 60 days to file the life event and make changes adding you to their insurance coverage. And um, if you're married to an AA employee, uh, one thing to remember is that when you go on your spouse's, your AA spouse's insurance, it's not going to carry over like with COBRA, where your deductibles and out-of-pockets continue. It's like you're starting all over from step one. So you'll have to reestablish your deductible and your out-of-pocket max. So a lot of people that are going on their AA spouse's insurance benefits choose to retire at the end of a, the year for that reason. So they don't have to go a couple of months without, you know, and, resetting their whole deductible and everything if they can just wait till the end of the next year and do it. All right, optional insurance. Um, examples include MetLife Legal, your long-term care insurance, home and auto policies, and pet insurance. So um, jumping ahead, these policies you can continue. You just have to contact the administrator of the plan and let them know, hey, I'm retiring. I want you to start billing me directly and 
Um, they'll send you a bill. Sometimes it's quarterly. Sometimes you pay a whole year at a time. It varies from vendor to vendor, but um, you can keep all of these different insurance coverages when you retire, if you choose to do so. Um, your employer life insurance and accident, accident insurance will end. However, you are given the opportunity to port or convert those policies into an individual policy. And again, that's between 30 and 60 days from the day you retire. So if you want to, um, the good thing about this is it doesn't require a physical exam. So if you've got health issues, they're not gonna ask you any health questions. Um, you would contact New York Life for the AD&D and Voluntary Personal Accident Insurance, and you'd contact MetLife for the uh, life insurance. It does get more expensive because you're converting it from a uh, group policy under the company to an individual policy. But um, one tip is that you don't have to convert the whole amount. So say you've been doing you know, seven times pay and you just want to convert maybe one times pay or 20,000 or something, they don't, you know, they'll let you convert a lesser amount if you want to do that. Can I interject there? Yes. One of the things you might want to think about when you're talking about updating, uh, uh, convert, putting, converting your life insurance, why? You're going to be paying a monthly rate and if you're doing the port and convert, it's probably going to be a pretty good, why? Is that so you can leave something for your heirs? Well, maybe if I don't pay the premium and just have the uh, just just have the money, uh, I could leave leave them some of that. And more importantly, if something happens to me and I have that cash, instead of having sent that off for life insurance, I have something to cover my uh, my expenses. Life insurance to me tends to be to cover those promises we make to other people that we can't keep because we die. So for instance, kids, college, uh, you know, those sorts of things. Hopefully by the time you retire, those are all done. So we, we've been on autopilot and doing life insurance because adults have to do that, right? Maybe you've reached the point where you no longer need to do that. So think about it before you spend this big money for the port and convert. Yeah, if you still have a child in college or a disabled child or you're worried about it's just you and your spouse and your spouse is disabled or something like that there may be reasons to have it exactly. but you do want to examine all that and a good person who can help you look at that is a financial advisor all right so your long-term and short-term disability policies in however if you filed a claim for long and short-term disabilities the payments from those uh, metlife you know disability plans can continue if you remain eligible under the provisions of the plan. So um, keep that in mind just because your coverage ends, if you're already receiving payments for an eligible disability, those payments could continue after retirement. All right, dental insurance. Ah, it's scary and I keep hearing from retirees that it's really depressing because nobody wants to take care of retiree teeth. What's going on? We need that dental coverage even more after we retire. And I think it's improving slowly, so stay tuned. But um, when you retire, you will be offered retiree medical insurance. It's a MetLife product. It's a code rated. Most people do not take it because it's a high dollar, low benefit. So your coverage is about the same as what you pay monthly. You know, it's not really worth it for most people, but it is offered to you. So I just want you to know. Um, AA Credit Union, some other options. The AA Credit Union has a dental club from Benefit Services of America. Some people sign up for that. It's not really insurance. It's like a discount group. And if you go to one of the doctors in the group, you get a better rate. Costco has something similar. So a lot of people use that service. Um, dental schools, you can go and be a guinea pig. Hey, some people get really good results from that. And um, somebody, being trained as a dentist will be on their best behavior and they will be supervised by a dentist. So there you go. Um, also, Medicare supplement plans and the Medicare Advantage plans are starting to offer more options that you can, they're usually an optional thing that you add to your plan. Um, so ask your Medicare advisor about options for dental and vision. Okay, flex spending. 
So normally every year we talk about our flex spending accounts and we say you gotta use it or lose it. You know, if you don't use it all, then you lose it. Except, except for $500 we'll transfer over into the next year. Well, when you retire, it's the one time that you can use it and they lose it, meaning the company. So if say you elect to put, you know, what is it, three thousand or twenty seven hundred in your yeah. in your flex spending account and you use it all in you know by March and then you retire April first and you made like four, you know, three deposits in into the flex spending. So and you've used it all already, the company's just going to have to eat it. They can't come up after you for the rest of the de deposits that you would have made throughout the year had you not retired. So you might want to think about that if you want to use up all your flex spending and then retire. Okay, it saves you a little bit of money. All right, now it's your turn to decide and Patrick's going to give us some words of wisdom about whether or not you might be ready to retire. You know, we look at this and there are an awful lot of moving pieces to this, but um, the, the lights are going crazy. Light, yeah, the lights are going on and up. Um, I guess I'm having those mini strokes again. Yeah. The, uh, but see, I am very confident because I have been working with flight attendants for a very long time and I know how complicated things flight attendants handle. And there is nothing that you can't handle. How do you do that? Well, let's start. But uh, let's start a list. And uh, uh, it's it's a great checklist. It starts on, on page 37 of the APFA retirement package good slide. And uh, it's a it's a it's a checklist. And you use checklists all the time. How do you do checklists? One task, one step at a time in order, just like the planned emergency checklist. I like to think of it as a planned departure checklist. Sounds good. Yeah. And if you do that, it'll work wonders because it'll keep you focused. Because like I say, there's a lot of things going on here. Also, don't be afraid to ask questions. This is the first time you've retired. Okay. And they, they, they don't, they, I went to a way too much schooling and none of those classes taught me how to retire. So, and it's not, obviously it's too complicated that you just, you know, it came to you in your genes. This is, this is a complicated thing. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, talk to a financial advisor, call the union, APFA, send us a, an email at retirement at APFA.org and uh, send us a, a question in the chat. And you know what? I have great confidence in you. I know you are prepared. You've got this. Let's go. Good slide. Questions? All right. Looks like we've got a few more. Oh, yes. How do we estimate our pension amount? Oh, that's back to pensions. Yeah, we had one come in. Okay. All right. Uh, how do we estimate our pension? Uh, if you have an LUS or PBGC pension, you'll want to go to the PBGC website and uh, request it. Normally, it's, it's quicker to call and ask them to send you a pension estimate. If you have an LU, uh, LAA pension on the Fidelity website, netbenefits.com slash AA, click on the, uh, the retirement plan, flight attendant retirement plan there and click on collect and get an estimate. I just turned 65. Do I have to sign up for plan A if I continue to work? So if you turn 65 and you're still planning to work, you are not required to sign up for any of the parts of Medicare until you retire from the company. Um, a lot of people do go ahead and sign up for part A because there's normally not a cost associated with it. And by signing up, you're in the Medicare system that might make the process I'll run a little bit more smoothly when you eventually sign up for Part B and D and the rest of it. However, you're not required to sign up for Part A. Um, the only reason that you absolutely don't want to sign up for Part A is if you have the core plan for your insurance coverage. That's the high deductible plan, and that's the plan that has the health savings account associated with it. And if you have any parts of Medicare, you're not allowed to contribute to your HSA account. Not FSA, not HRA. HRA or any of the other accounts. The only 
uh, plan that you don't want to sign up for Part A while you're still employed is the core plan, the high deductible plan. So, so the answer back to your question is um, you don't have to sign up for Part A until you retire, but lots of people go ahead and sign up for Part A. For those eligible for Medicare, can you give us some information regarding a supplemental plan to go along with Medicare? Is it necessary? Is it advised? Uh, well, as we mentioned in our presentation, it is advised because your regular Medicare does not have an out-of-pocket max. So if you, you know, get a serious illness or you get hit by a car or something, your out-of-pocket expenses, even though it's only 20% of the whole, that can creep up. So that's what the supplement or advantage plans protect you from to a certain extent. So it is advisable as far as which plans are best. We can't really speak to that because as we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, we're not Medicare experts, but there are a lot of Medicare experts out there. So call one of them and try and get some information about the difference between the supplement versus the Advantage plans. And there's a good list of the Advantage plans available, or the uh, supplemental plans available on page 31 of the good slide. And you can compare the benefits. Uh, and as an example, that may be important. Some of them cover uh, coverage outside of the United States and some do not. So. And there's a really good guide that Medicare puts out every year. It's called Medicare and You, and you can download it from the Medicare website, which again is www.medicare.gov. If you go through that, and usually if you're Medicare age, they're just going to send it to you, but um, it answers a lot of your questions. Can you apply for Medicare Part A prior to three months prior? You can start the process because your initial enrollment period for Medicare when you turn 65 is three months before the month of your birthday and three months after. So you can apply for Medicare Part A anywhere during that time period. If we're still working and have health insurance from a spouse, do we still need to sign up for Medicare Part A when we turn 65? OK, if you have Medicare, I know for American Airlines because they have more than 20 employees, so they have creditable coverage. And if you you work for an employer that has more than 20 employees, you can delay signing up for Medicare. So if your spouse or also works for an employer with more than 20 employees, you can delay. If they are self-employed or if they work for a smaller company, you probably are going to need to check with their health benefits people about whether you need to sign up for Medicare <laughs> or not. All right. Excuse me. I appreciate the good slide. I'm about to turn 65, but not quite ready to retire, hopefully by the end of 2024. I'm trying to figure out Medicare and slightly confused about when I have to sign up if I continue to work. I know Plan A is free, but I've also heard that if I don't sign up for Medigap within six months, it could mean higher premiums, pre-existing conditions. And when do I submit Form L564? Okay, you're almost exactly correct. The one thing is, there's a penalty if you don't sign up for Medicare Parts B and D when you're supposed to. Well, when what am I supposed to? If you don't have insurance from somebody else, you're supposed to at 65. And if you're running without insurance and you wait uh, more than six, three months after you turn six, four months after you turn 65, you're going to pay a penalty. But you're supposed to sign up for Medicare if you have uh, employer uh, medical coverage within 90 days of losing your employer coverage. Well, wait, what if I'm like 82 and I still have employer coverage? Your your medical, Medicare supposed to date is when the day you lose your uh, American coverage. Yes, when you retire from your job um, after the age of 65, you're entitled to what they call a special enrollment period. I'm special. And we're all going to be special when we retire. But um, so you're entitled to a special enrollment period and it begins when you retire and you have a certain period of time to sign up. And that's when you need to present that uh, Medicare employment verification form to show that you have had coverage from your company um, up until you retire but between age 65 and the day of your retirement. So. Um, if you have more questions about that, um, give us a call 
but that form again it's the best time to submit that form to the company is 60 days before you retire because that gives them time to fill it out and get it back to you and then that gives you 30 days to get signed up for medicare so and then once you um, retire your active insurance will end and hopefully if you've done everything correctly medicare will start the next day and you're good to go my husband will reach medicare before me there's a couple questions in here he's okay. covered uh, he's covered under my insurance should he not take medicare part b is there any downside does he need to choose when he applies for medicare and when will my insurance still act as a secondary if he cho does choose part b Okay, I'll do the first couple okay. questions, then you can do the rest. Um, the is there a downside to taking part B? Yes, it costs more and doesn't cover as much. Uh, you may not consider that a downside. I do. Uh, you know, as much as I grumble about Americans' uh, health insurance, it's better than Medicare on most things. So yeah, uh, if you can, if you talk to people who have gone to Medicare, most of them will tell you, yeah, I wish I'd stayed with America. There are a couple of advantage plans that may be advantageous to you, but um, the you know you want to talk to a Medicare advisor and make sure for most people staying with Americans insurance is better. Okay, so the rest of the questions were Josh, uh, is there uh, a downside? Does he need to choose when he applies for Medicare? Okay, so if he decides to stay on your coverage, he can wait until you retire. And when you retire, in addition, if you're over 65 to requesting that employment verification form for yourself, you'll also request one for your spouse. And that way it will show that you and he have both had coverage since you turned 65. Or if you retire before you turn 65, you'll just need to get it for your spouse if he's been on your coverage. So that pre prevents him from being uh, subject to any late enrollment penalties. Um, and if you sign up for Medicare Part B while you have the company insurance, the company insurance is always primary um, if you're still working. If you say you want your Part B Medicare insurance to be primary, you will be dropped from the company insurance. So you can't have the company insurance as a secondary to be while you have Medicare as primary, but you can have Medicare as a secondary while you have the company insurance as primary. Um, is our company paid 70,000 uh, term life insurance or any life insurance packages we are offered portable and able to be retained in retirement? Uh, convertible and portable. Uh, the, uh, the portable means you get to take the term life insurance with you. Uh, like we talked about, it's expensive. So you may not want to take all of it. You may just want to take part of it. The convert means you could convert it from a term life insurance to a whole life insurance. Of course, you're leaving and you're not young anymore. I'm not going to say you're old, but you're not young anymore. And so the premiums are going to, again, be pretty severe. So uh, you may find it cheaper to be out there looking for life insurance from companies that specialize in, in writing uh, life insurance for less young people. And if you go on, um JetNet and go to the benefits section of JetNet and you click to go to my.aa.com, which is where we link to to enroll in our benefits and everything. If you do a search for life insurance, they'll show the um, port convert kit for life insurance and you can get an idea of how much that's going to cost if you decide to port or convert your life insurance when you retire. Um, I started with the mainline Piedmont Airlines, not the commuter, and merged into US Air. I was told through PBGC that we top out at our pension at age 72, not 70 and a half. So is 70 and a half for legacy AA? 70 and a half is for legacy AA. So the PBGC has information which we don't have about the uh, former US Airways and all the plans that came into US Airways. So what they give you as far as that will be correct for you. Um, if I'm married to another AA employee that won't retire for another 10 years, can I opt to be on his medical plan without hurting my Medicare benefits? Yes, you can. Great. 
And our last question of the day. Uh, what I need to do for Medicare and can I do this before 65? Is there paperwork to fill out? How much, how do I get the paperwork? I plan on working until 70. Very good summary question. So if you plan on working till 70, I would suggest that you wait until, you know, 60 days before you retire at age 70 and do that process of signing up for Medicare then. If you want to sign up for Part A, while you're still working when you turn 65, you have that initial enrollment period and it's three months before your birthday month, your birthday month, and three months after your birthday month. So you could go ahead and sign up for Part A during that initial enrollment period and wait and sign up for everything else after you retire. Okay, great. Well, thank you for joining us today. I know it's been a lot of information. Um, we've got, again, these great resources on the website, apfa.org, and on the retirement page, um, the Good Side Packet. Where else is a good place to get information? Uh, you want to check, she was talking earlier about the uh, AA, myaa.com. Um, or is it my dot? For the retiree. In the retiree section there. Uh, on JetNet, look for uh, the uh, resources, look for their their. They have a little page. guide that's called Step into Retirement. It has like about six or seven steps. So it's useful, not as useful as our. Not as useful as our 70. Fabulous but, packet, yeah. Yeah. good slide, get it. It's going to be your best resource. Great. Any parting thoughts? No, just thanks everybody for listening and you had good questions today. And don't miss the end of the chocolate sale. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you again for being on. We will send out the recording uh, within the next couple of days and uh, we look forward to seeing you on another one. Bye.